I think a parent should like honestly have a daily ritual of just one minute, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, chalavai, of naches, of like remembering, I davened for this child, I wanted this child, this child. And I always tell my children, you're mushlam, you're perfect for me. Meaning this child is mushlam, they're the perfect child for me. And and really, a parent is the one who gives hmm. their child Wow, the I love that. Yeah, I... I I, I think that it's so important and I also think it's so important for us to remember the beautiful work we're doing by being parents and educators, you know, and also an educator is considered a parent to mm. a child. And that means that if you constantly remind yourself that you're working in Abra Kodesh and that raising a child is such holy work. Welcome back to another amazing episode in this series, Building Relationship with One Child. After focusing on the basics, the fundamentals, we move on to get practical with Mrs. Alana Mizrahi, who is, amongst other things, a great parenting coach. We'll hear her advice on how to build a good and healthy relationship with your child from the early age to the teenagers, and how to create the atmosphere of availability and being the go-to person for our children, which is so incredibly important and how to discipline without damaging the relationship. We will learn about the importance of self-awareness, constant interaction, respect, and acceptance. Without further ado, enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another amazing episode of The Jews Next Door as we talk to another one of the amazing leaders in our in our door about how to raise the Jews next door. I want a really special welcome and thank you to Mrs. Alana Mizrahi, for, who is a parenting coach amongst many, many other things. And a really big thank you for taking the time to talk about the Jews Next Door. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. So in this, in this segment, we're going to be talking about the, the practical of building a relationship with one's child. So I want to start off just really very basic. What does a good, healthy relationship with one's child look like? Yeah, so a good, healthy relationship with one's child really has to start with having a good, healthy relationship with yourself, like every relationship, meaning the more that I am filling up my own cup and understanding that if I'm overly exhausted, if I'm, you know, having, if I'm having have so many factors that I'm trying to build a relationship with a child and I'm not even attending to myself and knowing where I'm coming from, it's very hard to then have a healthy relationship with the child. They're picking up on their energy. They're picking up all the things that are happening in your life is being picked up by the kid probably. And also I just personally, as a mom, I know that if I'm, not feeling myself up, not in tune with myself, not understanding where something is coming from inside of me, then I can't accept the child. And if you can't accept the child, you can't have a relationship with the child. Interesting. Meaning, I'll give an okay. example. So first things first, yeah. you got to self-care. Gotta, okay, yeah, please. Self, you have to have self-care. You have to have self, self-awareness. self It's not even just self-care. It's a self-awareness. Because sometimes we can't necessarily mm-hmm. take it. Sometimes you can't get more sleep. But you have to have a self-awareness of understanding that this is going to affect my relationship with my child by me being so tired. So that means I have to put in a lot more effort in in accepting the situation. Got it. Got it. Got it. Wow. Okay. That's great. That's a very, very good point. So let's say you have that self-awareness and that, and the self-care, right? Let's you have that. Right. And you have the basics of, you know, expressing love, genuinely caring about your child. What practical things must one do in order to create that, relationship with their child. Meaning once you've gotten past the self aspect of it that you mentioned, great. Right. What's, right. what's the next step? Practically so next, speaking. Practically speaking, you have to have time with your child in order to create a relationship with your child. It doesn't, you know, happen by also having these like, let's go on, I'm going to go on a date with my kids. So once a month, I'm going to take them and do this amazing thing. And I've had moms call me and be like, I don't understand it. I spent the whole day with her. I took her shopping. I bought her ice cream. I did this and this and this. And then at the end of the end, and it's for nothing. So a relationship isn't a one-time thing. It's not a big event. If you really have wants a relationship Mm -hmm. with a child, just a relationship with anybody also is that it's those small nuggets snippets throughout the day. It's having an interaction. And every time a child and I come into contact with each other, I actually look at the kid in the eyes and maybe smile. You know, I have to sit down and play a whole board game with them for an hour, but I'm, I'm having a relationship by just being there and interacting it's right, so funny. Right. So you're saying for really just, big just spending time. Well, that's, that's the number one thing. Like we look for really big answers and we think that we have to like travel, you know, very far. And actually it's such mm-hmm. a basic things. It's having physical contact with your child, actually like 
touching your child. You know, it, we see so many studies about the importance of physical touch. It's having eye contact. It's having moments where you can just be in silence. You don't have to fill it up all the time by talking and having that. It's also mm-hmm. having an idea that I love you and I accept you unconditionally just because you're my child. That's how you build a relationship. Right, right. So how does that look different with, you know, with the different ages? Because, you know, like you just mentioned, physical touch. So obviously that's going to look differently when, you know, a child's younger versus when they're in their teenage years. And especially when you're dealing with adult children and the same thing with the spending the time, because, you know, as children get older, there is just less time that they have. So how, how does, how does that, you know, practically speaking look like? Right. So practically speaking for a young child, like for a very small child, the touch part actually isn't so difficult because you're, you are touching them by feeding them, by bathing, you're, you're in constant contact with them you're sort of shepherding them along. So that's a little bit more easy. Already though, from the time a kid is five, six, you'll notice that parents are not touching their kids so much and they really need that. So there, when we think of touch, it's not necessarily this all the time hugging kid. You know, it's not, it has to be affectionate. It just has to be like, when I hand you something, I'm actually going to touch your skin. I'm going to actually touch you and I'm going to give you a pat. As a child gets mm-hmm. older, like my, let's say my, my teenagers, they don't want me hugging and them and this kind of, con- especially. Right. It's not, it's, it's not that it's not appropriate, but it's, it would be, it would be too forced. It wouldn't be spontaneous. You know, I mean, when it's spontaneous, it's wonderful, but when it's like, I have to Mm -hmm. touch it. So there, there, it's the same thing. Like I'm patting on the, on the shoulder. I'm like readjusting a payas. I'm like, you know, being like, oh, that's a really pretty sweater. And I'm, I'm actually (laughs) physically giving contact and and warmth. And, um, for, and the difference with spending time with a small child is that, a lot of times when kids are small, if you have a lot of kids that are in the same age group, you tend to herd them together like sheep. So it's like, okay, everybody's going to sleep now and everybody's eating dinner mm-hmm. now and everybody's, and that's just a reality. We're very busy people and you can't spend 20 minutes giving this one food and 20 minutes, you know, like an assembly line. So what do you do? You're just focusing. You're literally just looking at that one child though. And again, maybe calling them by their name, actually focusing on them listening to them, spending, even if it's among the five other kids that you have, but you're focused on this child. And as they get older, like you were mentioned, okay, it's, um, it's true. You're not going to have that where you're going to be necessarily eating so much with them or talking so much with them. But for it, as a child enters into teenage years, the most important thing is just availability. Like for example, my son, he just left for Yeshiva Godola this Mm -hmm. this week. He's 17 years old. So I don't see him. I mean, thank you. It was very emotional for me. Um, I'm very close with him and talk about building a relationship. It's a kid kid that I would go walking at 10 o'clock, whenever he got home, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night from like Shiva Shikatana or when he was, and I would go on a walk with him. And he looked, he would, he wants to go on walks with me. Like, okay, you know, if it's Motsi Shabbos or whatever, we go on Hmm. our walk together and we talk together. And it was very emotional. So then now what? How am I going to make a relationship? How did you How did you build that? That's incredible. It's beautiful. It was honestly by walking with him. I, I want to get back to that also. But how did you, like, where did that come from in a way? Meaning like, how did you build that? Like, where did it first start that you were like taking walks and spending the time that way? Well, first it comes from taking an interest in your kids. Like, you know, I... All, my mm-hmm. kids see kind of me going walks with them now actually gives a privilege. Like the little ones want to go for walk, going for walk with mommy is like, wow, mm-hmm. because I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to listen. And that means that one, I, I, for example, I'm not like a car maven. I don't know anything about cars. I have one kid who loves cars. So I remember we would go for a walk with him mm-hmm. and he would be like, mommy, that's a, he would tell me all the names of the, of the makers. And I, you just listen and you get, inv- you get excited about it. Not because it's really interesting me because I'm excited that he's excited. So I just want to listen. And there is something right. you said about like right, physical, right, right. you know, doing something physical with your child. So it started just sort of like a, as an excuse to go for some fresh air. I need some exercise. Will you come with me? Let, let's go for a walk. I want to be with you. Let's go for a walk. And you do it a little hour that, you know, he was, it was mm. a privilege. Like he's the oldest he gets to go. But now, so what, how do I do it is wow, um, I, I just that. know that for him, if he calls, I'm dropping everything. And I will, and he, he, now I told him, I, I said to him, it reminds him there is such a mitzvah called Kivut FM. And I'm, I said, so if I tell you to call me, then you're already getting to do this mitzvah. <laughs> so two o'clock, at least for the past, you know, this week, two o'clock, exactly on the dot, he calls me and I pick up the phone. It's, it's, it's him. I mean, if I'm not available for this child that I only have five minutes with him and I say to him, wait a minute, one second, sweetie, I have a client or I have another caller. The other kids need me. What am, what am I telling him? So for right. two years, it's just availability. You know, when you have a certain flow and atmosphere in the house, that will build a relationship. Like if I have an atmosphere in my house that says, 
you can come, like we can talk about any topic and I'm open to it, then that's, that's a whole atmosphere of availability and I want a relationship with uh-huh. you. And even if I don't know the answer. So is, it, is that stated explicitly? No, no. I mean, how do you create that atmosphere in the house? Because kids ask questions when they're little, they ask questions, at least mine did. And they're asking questions. They're even asking questions like, hmm. why does that person have like a big pimple on their nose? I mean, they're asking the most random questions, right? And if you were to be like, look at them like you're crazy, right, 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 you ask sure. this question. Or if you were to say to them, like, that's ridiculous. Or, But instead, if you just get curious, if you're as curious as your children are curious, you're curious about them then they understand that they can come to you with any question. Now, there are times that I've said to them, look, sweetie pie, when you get to be older, I will explain this more to you. You know, and I'll give the example of like, mm-hmm. you know, like if I'm five years old, I'm not going to reach the steering wheel to drive the car. So there's there's times. I don't have to answer everything right now, but you can come to me and I will answer always and right. truthfully. Because also it's another thing. If you lie to your child, even if you were to say yeah. like, you know, babies are from the bird, the, you know, the stork, then um, that also, it creates distrust and then they won't come to you. But if you're honest with them and you're open with them, maybe if you say to them right now, I can't talk about that, but I will have this conversation with you. It creates a relationship. Interesting. I feel like for a younger child, that'd be very hard because they have like a hard time with the, I guess, like with the patience of like, but just tell me now, like, I, I want to know, or like, you know, like, so how so does, how, how would that conversation so go with, I guess, like, I guess a younger child or even a middle school child? Right. It's so easy with a little kid because usually they're actually very sad. If you're just, there's a, there's a, a cloud, like a, a general rule, just be honest, but you can be concise and vague, which means is, is that I'm going to supply mm-hmm. them information, but it's going to be according to their question. I'm not going to go on a whole discourse and a whole lecture, you know, about something that's like way above their head. I'll be concise. I will be a bit vague and I will just answer directly their questions. Honestly, <laughs> And if it's something, and it might even, it might be something I don't even know about. And I could say, we'll investigate this. We'll look this up. We'll, we'll find out about it, but mm-hmm. I'll get back to you. Like one of my, I remember I'm also happen to be a doula. So there's a lot of births in my, in my, um, in my mm-hmm. household. They, and one of my children asked me questions and, and he, and I said to him, I reassured him. I said to him, I don't want you to worry. I said, when God willing at the right time, when you, I said, when you're going to be an Abba, I will explain every single thing to you so that your, I said, your email will be, the email will be so prepared, you know, and he was so satisfied with that. Like I said, I'm taking care of you. Right. You don't worry about it. I said, but right now we've got some time, you know, like, but I wasn't, I, I just feel like, um, children really respect honesty and they, they know, you know, so also not to worry somebody. Like if somebody like, you know, they hear, they hear now kids hear so much about what's going on. And you just have to be concise, but be honest Mm -hmm. and just answer the question according to how, what they're asking and not start, you know, three, three steps ahead of them. Right, 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 right. For sure. For sure. I'm curious, you know, like you, you were mentioning, we, we just discussed the concept of helping children feel comfortable to be able to, to share openly. I was recently reading a book and the book spoke about a very important thing about being the go-to person for one's children. And like how important it is to be able to be that go-to person. So it's, it's similar in terms of like how to become comfortable for them to share, but how do you not only just make it that they're comfortable sharing, but that you are constantly that go-to person. It's also you being comfortable yourself with the topics that they might want to bring up. So that's again, another about self-awareness and Mm -hmm. that if you're starting to cringe inside of yourself, when a topic is brought up and you're a little bit embarrassed about it, or you're uncomfortable about it, I would say, you know what, first of all, why don't you get comfortable with things so that when your kids can come to you, you will be that go person. And even if sometimes I will say to them, I really don't know about that, you know, they, or I, I would rather tell them just honestly, I'm actually not comfortable with that subject then pretend I'm comfortable with it. And then they can just read that and they're not going to come to you. And right, right. just, and also I'll be honest with you. Another mm-hmm. thing that I do is that I will express to my children. They know that I'm also seeking guidance. Like they know that I'll call, I'll talk to my rabbits and they know we're going to ask a raw. They, they, they have a concept of knowing mm-hmm. that if I don't know something and I need some information, I want to go to someone who's, who's older than me, who's wiser than me and who's someone I really respect. So I try to be that person God willing, who they respect and who's wise, you know, wiser and I'm for sure older. (laughs) If you're looking for a great way to have some good, clean, kosher fun with your children through the powerful effect of music, 
look no further because J Karaoke is here. J Karaoke gives one and all the platform to belt out their favorite tunes from a library of thousands of Jewish songs, hundreds of artists, and genres across multiple decades of incredible Jewish music. Personally, I know that I love singing, I love it. I love karaoke, but I was really never able to get into it because it wasn't the Jewish songs. And that's where J Karaoke comes in with their huge selection from the latest hits to the classics. They even have nursery rhymes for your little ones. And with features like key changes to help you sing, to make you more comfortable as you're singing, and speeding it up or slowing down the song, they have really thought of everything. To enjoy Jewish karaoke your way, all you need to do is head to jkaraoke.com. Choose a subscription that fits for you. And to make it even more fun, you could purchase their state of art karaoke kit, which gives you the feeling as if you are today's top singer, you can insert whoever you feel it is. Connect your kit to any device, like it could be a laptop, a computer, a tablet, whatever it is. And you plug in your speaker, plug in your J Karaoke microphone, and you sing away. It's as easy as that. That's all it is. And it's really fun. I checked out their website. It really looks amazing. They have an incredible, incredible amount of song selection. Anything you want. They got Thank You Hashem. They got Mordechai Shapiro. They really got it all. You can subscribe monthly for just $4.99 a month yearly for $49.99 and we have a special deal here for you for any of our listeners if you use the code Jews next door D-O-R you get an additional 10% off and if you don't want your children to be using a device with internet J Karaoke has got you covered you can download the app onto your desktop once you have it up turn off the internet let them sing all day long without the internet check out J Karaoke today and let the fun begin right right it's interesting on the first point, I, I find that with teaching a lot that when you know, like to be, whenever st- students ask me questions, if I ever feel like a little bit like unsure about it, so then those are the areas that I need to then go research myself more so that I can feel comfortable myself. And that way then they'll f- feel my confidence and my comfort with me and then be able to ask me those types of questions or ask me questions in, in any area. So exactly. that's, a, that's a very interesting point. I hear that. That's, that's exactly. a very good point. W- would you say that there's any rituals that you'd recommend uh you know like i know you, you're a parent coach so or you know parenting classes that you would recommend towards building that strong parent-child relationship any specific rituals so I, I i do feel like there is from the very beginning that they're little again a ritual of just having that physical contact with them is very important a ritual of having special time with them but it's misunderstood people think like they that they have to announce it and say this is our special time with you know, David, it, it's, it has to be something that's just well, from the very time that they're little, that they understand that they can get a focus mommy, a focus Abba. You're creating mm-hmm. that they will then also understand that they can come to you. And if you can just from the fundamental things of spending some quality time daily, again, the, ch- the little tiny nuggets and not just the ones boom of having physical interaction with your children. Also having, you have to have, this is like, I think almost every parenting person, you know, coach and teacher will tell that there has to be a majority amount of positive to negatives in your house. Meaning the interactions have to be at least 80% positive, right. but not a hundred percent, which is also a problem because mm-hmm. I think that now it's, parents tend to be afraid of their children and a child will not right. feel safe in their own home. If they don't feel like they have a parent who will discipline them when they're doing something that they're not in control. When a child's out of control, they need a parent to, to be able to contain them and make them safe. So if I'm only positive with my child, if I will never wow, see that's such an them, interesting point. Yeah. I don't feel safe. I'm going to give you why, an why would a child not feel safe? Well, let's but let's put it in adult society. If everything was allowed, you're allowed to murder, you're allowed to steal. You're allowed to just go to anybody's house, take whatever you want from them. Um, you're allowed to say anything that you want. You're allowed to scream at people, you're allowed to do whatever you want. Do you feel safe? Is that called a safe society? Mm-hmm. Right, no, right, a safe society right. is I know that there's boundaries mm-hmm. and there's right. limits. A safe society means that if I have, um, I'm in an area and it's an open area and I could fall off a ledge, I'm not safe that it's so open. But if there's a fence, then I can mm-hmm. run around free because mm-hmm. I understand that that's going to keep me from falling over. So that's where, but we need to have a big space for them to run around in. So that's where the 80, you know, 80 to 20, the eight, the four to the four to one ratio comes in that the majority of time there's upbeat, there's music, there's, you know, there's, or just e- easy going, like there's going with the flow that you, you know, and then there has to be 20, 20% right. of the time where I'm saying, you know what, sweetie pie, we have to go to bed now. And, um, I'm drawing limits mm-hmm. and 
structure. Right. And that gets back to your point before about a parent being self-aware of like them knowing if being able to switch on and off and and knowing when they can and, and when it's like too much for themselves in a way, meaning for, for a parent to say, um, you know, I want to always be positive, but then like when it gets so frustrating and it's like you, you know, you just, you, you let it go for too long and then you kind of just like totally lose it. Exactly. So that wasn't being self-aware in a way exactly. and that, you know, really can be destructive to that relationship. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Also, you, you mentioned before that the, you know, like announcing when really like specifically saying the, the, like, this is special time to have together. Um, I know you mentioned when we were, when we were speaking originally, like, you know, when we were setting up the time to speak about the podcast that, uh, you know, like how your, your background really gave you that perspective is, you know, about the, you know, how special each, each and every single child was. If if you, if right. you feel comfortable to to share a little bit about that. Right. No, just, I, uh, my husband and I were, we were, we, before we had our first, it took us four and a half years. So, um, but you know, it's funny. A, a, I think a, when a couple wants to have a child, even one month that they're waiting, that they want to have that child and they, they can't is, is enormous. So I, I don't want to, I can't qualify or quantify, you know, between, even if it's a month or got, you know, if it's 20 years, I'm, I'm not trying to say which, but we wanted it and we couldn't, and you know, we weren't blessed right away and it felt excruciating in the process. Cause you never know, will I ever have a kid or not? And then my, and then when you have one, you're saying to yourself, well, I have more. And it's a complete and totally relinquishing. Right. It's, it's giving over to a Kaddish Bahu. And when I was finally pregnant, I was just so happy. I was flying and I had the most beautiful health, healthy. I thank Hashem for having a healthy pregnancy and a healthy birth. So, I just felt like I came into parenting with so I, I felt blessed that by that test to come into parenting with so much right so so much desire and so much wanting, and um, but I will tell you something very interesting, which it's not my only experience. I've actually heard this even I have heard this from people who have waited 10, 15 years for children. That when you have your child, though. Mm. You, you just, you for sure are a different parent because it's like some, every, every time we wait for something and we get it, we, we do have this, I think, heightened appreciation for it. But then life yeah, kicks in sure. and all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, how am I doing this? And, and, and I remember waking up every 45, I wasn't <laughs> even waking up. I was, I don't know what you would call that. I was every 45 minutes with my baby and feeling so overwhelmed and like, how could I not? Be on, you know, and I was like, oh, I'm tired, you know, and then I remember just holding him and I'll tell you what I did. And I think this is also so important for building relationship. I just started talking to him about how much I love him at like one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning and reminding myself, this is the child that I dominant for. Zen, like on this, ch- this, for this child I dominant mm, for. And wow. to, I always tell the, the uh, mommies and my parenting groups, do not forget that under the chuppah or at one point of your life, you know, you didn't have to wait so long. I know you dominant for your children. And each one of these children is the one that you wanted. And right. I, 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 I remember having this moment of mm. that oldest. So my oldest, when he was like two, you know, and he, for sure, by two was already knew how to climb out of a crib. And he was, oh, you know, he was this energetic. All my kids, thank God, have so much energy. And I remember one time he was like running away from me. And I looked at him and I said to him, I said to him, Avram Nisim, do you know what you are? I said those words. And he looks at me and he goes, at Sadiq. <laughs> and then he starts running away again. And I was like, yeah. yes. And I said to him, yes, you're a tzaddik. Like, <laughs> it's what I, you, you know, it was just one of these moments where I was just like so frustrated. But he knows that all the time that this is what I'm feeling about him. This is what I'm thinking about him. Right, right. I want, you know, you don't have to be calling it, but this is my feeling towards you is that I love you. I want you. And I have to remind myself of this. And um, with all my children, I, I make sure to have. right. right a quality time with myself where I'm just like having nachas, which means even if they're asleep, which sometimes, or they're out of the house and I'm like, mm. okay, I'm the best mommy when no one's home. I, it's a, it's a ritual that <laughs> I think a parent should like, honestly have a daily ritual of it, just one minute, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, halabai, of nachas, of like remembering I dominated for this child. I wanted this child, this child. And I always tell my children, you're mushlam, you're perfect for me. Meaning this child is mushla. They're the perfect child for me. And, and really a parent is the one who gives hmm. their child. Wow. Them. I love that. Yeah. I, I, 
I, I think that it's so important. And I also think it's so important for us to remember the beautiful work we're doing by being parents and educators, you know, and also an educator is considered a parent to hmm. a child. And that means that if you constantly remind yourself that you're working in Abra Kodesh and that raising a child is such holy work, you have to remind yourself of the importance because we take it for granted that it's just something that you do. But if you look and you refocus and you really force yourself right. to give yourself right. his look and refocus and say to yourself, I'm doing the most important thing that I'm doing. This is my tough key. You brought me into the world to carry on the torch to the next generation, to pass this on and to raise these children. And you put it into this light of I am hmm. doing the holiest work that I could possibly be doing. It gives you so it gives you koch and you go out there with a smile and you're able to to give them yeah. you know you, which wow. is the most important thing you could possibly give a child is actually Wow, you. wow. Ah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Wow. It's so powerful. So, so powerful. That's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. I wanna I wanna circle back a little bit yeah, to please. what we were discussing before. We were talking a little bit about that that 80-20. Yeah. Um, and you know, the happy, the, the good, the positive 80 and the 20. So in terms of building a relationship with one's child, practically speaking, it, it's, it, it, some, some parents sometimes feel, you know, like, like you were mentioning that they need to, they need to always be positive because of the fact that, you know, I don't want to be negative with my, with my child, but at the, the flip side, there's also, how does one maintain their relationship or not just maintain, but build a relationship with their child when they are disciplining? Because it, it, it kind of feels like, well, this is like the opposite of what's happening right now. Of I'm not building a relationship. And even though, and I, and I know what you said before in terms of a child needs to feel, needs, needs the discipline to feel safe. Right. But how does, in that moment, how does one deal with that? I, I, I know it sounds repetitive, but it goes back to also why am I disciplining this child? Like, am I having the self-awareness that I'm really doing the negative like for the sake of this child or am I really doing it because mm -hmm. I'm just being negative and angry and upset and if you have enough positivity I will tell you and mm -hmm. it's a random you know what mommy's having a really bad day I'm so tired right now I just I, I need to go that's not going to make a child trauma you know it's it's not going to cause a child to have a bad relationship with you if you say you know what I've had I, I I've had my limits I just I need to go lie down because it's once in a while right it's not about right. the kid. It's about me. If we're always kind of mm -hmm, focusing sure. that it's my, so, and then when it is the child, like I'm upset with you right now, or like, you know, something that you would need to discipline on. So then I'm doing it though. That is because I'm doing it because it's about you that I need to, meaning it's for your good. Like I need to, I need to take, I need to help you with this because um, it's a chinuch issue. It's not just my emotional issue that I'm having a problem with for myself. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So that's, that's getting back to what you were saying before about the, about right. the being self-aware. Right. Well, I, it makes and, sense. And also, but and also, in, ter and also in terms of the. No, no. So I was like, okay, so let's say pra no, no, please. practically speaking, right? Like let's say practically speaking, let's say I were to have a negative interaction with my child and you're right. Where is that? Like for a teenager, for example, then that's a whole different ballpark because a teenager you actually have to bring back. You have to make the effort right. to bring them back. You cannot mm. have push a teenager away, which you might have to do for something that's our value that you really stand on for the, you know, so that's fine. But then I'm going to have to get that kid back to me, which might mean it could be even just like, I'm going to have to, you know, offer that kid something, you know, like I, I'm going to have to do it though. I'm going to have to rebuild the relationship. Mm. I'm going to have to make it out. But with a little kid, I'm going to be really honest with you. A child who's an under teenager, they are so in love with their parents, <laughs> also teenager. But, you know, a kid, as you are disciplining a child, they will want you to give them a hug. Meaning like they will be, you don't have to try. That's why I, I tell parents, parents have to understand how much their kids want them and love them. If we could only understand how much our kids love us and want right. us. You know, then we would, if we could just then know that right now I'm disciplining the child. And in five minutes from now, we're going to go back to having a beautiful relationship because that's also children are very all the time in the moment. Yeah. I don't think we right, have to right, worry right. about that's the relationship. Point. That's yeah, I don't think point. we have to worry. I think a lot of parents feel guilty and they feel so bad. I just disciplined. I said no to the kid. And now we have this terrible relationship. It's not true. I really, I really feel that if you're doing it for the good of the child and they, they might not know that in the moment, but they really do know that. And, and if it's a small child, 
is so quickly, easily, if you're keeping only a 20% that you're doing this negativity, the 80% is positive then. And with a teenager, it has to be like 99% positive, but that where you stand your values on, you do it, Uh you're negative, but then you're bringing them back. Right, right, right. So you're saying in a way, there are going to be times where you're going to break that down, even though like intentionally to, to be rebuilding it eventually. Yeah. Because there's a value here though. Right. There's a value. Like I, I'm right. Like, like I'm educated. And, and what would you say is the best way to, to formulate that, that value? Let's say, you know, like you were about to say, you're going to educate, but like, so what, what, yeah. I, I, have, I have to have clarity on what I'm doing. Right. So like, let's say I'm, I'm trying to think like there's different age groups here, but if, if I have clarity on why I am giving this over, why I'm saying no to the child, why I'm putting limitations, boundaries, you know, things, or even ordering a child to do something, which is not a very good idea to make a habit of, because it's for sure going to be negative. I have to know it's because I need it done. Sure. Like, let's say right now, let's say I usually don't tell my kids, like, um, I, I don't like to order because then I know that then they have to do what I say. I mean, like if I say, even if I say to them, come to me, I, 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 you know, like from the, Really, we have to be careful with like how we speak. So from the very, very small ages, I don't want to actually even be, even a two-year-old, I don't want to start ordering and saying like, come to me. I don't want to start using that, that kind of language where already- so what, how would you, how would you I'm say training, it? I'm training them not to listen to me if they don't come and, or I have to read, you know, I have to, I don't want to have to enforce mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't even say anything actually. I just pick them up and bring them to me. I mean, so what, how would you- so for a two-year-old, I would just, uh, you know, or I would just be like, look, you know, I, I would try to use a cooperation technique. You know, there's tons of cooperation techniques of how to, that's like a whole class in itself, cooperation techniques. But I would try not to make it that they're like having to have this power struggle with me, you know, from their little. However, let's say the kid was getting too close to the sidewalk. And if I were to say, come to me, which would be like, and if they didn't, I would then reinforce right, it with a right, negative right, right. where, you know, it would be something with a negative, like a very stern voice of you better come now because it's dangerous. Sure, sure, sure. What age would you say that you, you, you shift that from just going and scooping them up and picking them up as opposed to saying, please come to me to directly saying to them? I don't think if there's any age you should be ordering your kids unless you want it to be something that they're going to do. Meaning if you're not willing to follow through with it and either – enforce it or punish it. So why are you telling them to do things? Unless it's something that's a value to me and really important, Mm -hmm. then I will, because I will fall through with it. But we have to just be careful. Like a lot of times we're just, there has to be values behind something. Like I I can give you lots of things that we have to find values in. For example, let's talk about food. Like that's a topic all the time. Parents are always struggling with little kids about eating, not eating, what they're eating, what, you know, it sounds like such a silly thing, but you turn into such a, there's a hashkafa there behind that that it like changes it. And there, for example, like if I actually have a value, if it's the food itself, why am I wasting a battle on this? But if I have a value, for example, um, I, I, I put an actual value into it. You know, like I, I'm saying um, maybe a value could even be like a, a, a parent who's so, so, so strict that first you have the dinner and then dessert. Okay, let's just say that. So I would say, well, what's the value there? There has to be more value the value there could be, I want there to be some kind of order in our meals. Like first we have this and then we have that. But I'm not going to punish the kid mm-hmm. because you're just eating right. a piece of cake. I'm punishing, if I'm going to punish on this, is because there's an I have a value called order. You know what I'm saying? Like I think once parents start to think about mm-hmm. what they're doing. Ah, uh, interesting. And put a little bit of thought process into. Wow, it, fascinating. It, into the process. Of, so you really got to think through the values before you. Yeah. I know it's, it's a lot of work to be a parent, <laughs> but um, yeah, you have to actually think behind your, <laughs> behind your values, you know, like, like there could be a value, right. for example, that if you have an important meeting wow. and you need the kids to hurry. And so then you could maybe, okay, you have to get dressed now. Whereas just sort of like shepherding them along and just like handing them things, you know, th- there are times when you have to tell the kid, let's go now. It's interesting, especially because now I feel like nowadays, Children do ask often more so, like, why? And unless if you have a real why, then their why is really warranted of saying, like, well, then why should I do that? Or why should I be listening to that? So that's uh, that's a very, well, very, very strong point. Very interesting. But that's also for your own clarity. It's not for their clarity. Meaning, like, you, I think automatically you will be a better right. parent if you have a, a value and a clarity. Of course, if you could, you know, but not always do we have to give that over to the kid verbally. 
but I, I, I feel like children do right, feel right, right, that right. if you have a clarity and a value, I'll, I'll many times like, or just even an instance, like, let's say I've told a child, um, if I've said, well, I've asked a Shaila, you know, then there's a clarity there. Like, let's say they ask me something and I, and I'll say, I actually asked right. about it. And this is the halacha. They understand that there's a, they're not going to even discuss this with me. There's such a clarity that there's a value. Mommy asked to Shaila. She has to rob. This is the clarity, right? Sure. And I've done this many times also with my teenagers right. where I really don't know what to do. And I'll be honest with them. And I'll be like, I really don't know what to do in this situation. Like I would feel more comfortable asking a rob or asking, you know, and, or I would say to them, I really need time to think about this. You know, and then they see that it's like I'm coming from a place where I have to see if I have a value or not a value in this. And and they're going to then they respect me, I think. I mean, I, I have a very good relationship with my teenagers that there's a lot of mm. respect there because I'm respecting them by not just telling them to do something. Right. I really want to have a thought process. And is there a value here? If you want a good relationship with your child, you have to right. respect right, them right, 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 and you have right. to love them and you have to accept them, which is it's a big avoda. But accepting mm. means I accept you without wanting to, to, fix, to change, break, you know, you. <laughs> Remake you. Right. And what, is, what does respect mean? Meaning what people, I, I feel like people often say that, right? In order to have a good relationship, you need to have respect. What, 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 what does that actually mean? What does it mean to respect a child? How does that respect, sh- how is it shown to a child? Respect means is that you're looking at a person in front of you and you're first of all realizing that they're at Salam al That literally this person in front of me is at Salam al Would I be talking like this? Would I be treating at Salam al like this? I think once you really do connect it to an ashama and you put in that godliness in it, and you say to yourself, would I, as a Salam al want to be talking like this? It's hard. The only reason why we don't talk to each other with respect is mm. because we are so far from the beauty of our own neshamas. I know that I'm not thinking about godliness right. when I'm yelling or out of control. I'm just thinking about my, what, I'm not even thinking. There goes that, right. you know, cortex brain. So uh, respect is looking, sure. at, looking sure. at a human being and saying, you are a soul, you're a neshama. That's number one. Number two is that being curious is also a sign of respect because you're not judging. For example, if, if a child is, you know, some, mm. you know, just sort of just be curious about the behavior, be curious about the questioning, be curious about like, why did they do that? I mean, not in a, you know, uh, you know, it's just such, sometimes things are so silly. Little kids also, unless they're taught something, everything is basically um, permitted for them because if they haven't been taught not to do something, they're going to think you can do right. it. So I remember, Correct. I, I remember, I think she was two right. or three at the time. Uh, one of my child took scissors and they cut up the couch. I had never taught them that you don't cut up couches, oh, gosh. but um, yeah, that was, right. that was, that was a fun thing. And I knew there's no discipline here. I mean, saying there's no like chinuch here. It already happened. The only chinuch now I could tell her is that mommy said we don't cut scissors. Right, right. Paper is scissors. At right, that moment, right. you know, you like just want to go crazy. And, and you just remember that this is just get curious. Why did she do that? You know what I'm saying? Like what was interesting for her about cutting up the couch? And all of a sudden I, I got calm. Like I mean, even, I'm, not, I'm I curious though. Yell, what- but internally I got calm because I was like curious. Like that's so interesting. Like why did she do mm-hmm. that? But is that a question when you, is that a question that you ask the child? Cause I feel like when you ask the child, it, wouldn't they no, no, just no, no. initially like knee jerk reaction feel like they are being, yeah, yeah, oh no, no, no not no. you're saying I, you're I, asking I, yourself. Internally that. myself. It's just like, oh, that's really interesting. Like I'm, I'm really, like, uh-huh. you know, and then all of a sudden I, I literally, I, I can calm down by getting cur- inside myself, you know, and it's not just with children. I think also in our, any personal relationships with anybody, if somebody's, you know, reacting in a way right. that's so inappropriate, sometimes you can just get curious and be like, I wonder why they're doing that. Not, it would sound condescending if you say it, like, why did you just do that? You know, that sounds like you're judging condescending. Right. <laughs> if you're thinking right, it in right. a genuine, like, curiosity kind of way, like, that's so interesting. I wonder why you, you know, not, and not to be like a therapist to your kid and not to get all psychological either, just to sort of like be curious about it, you will calm down. You will calm down and you'll be able to be a little bit more mm-hmm. rational and a bit, Right. more, you know, calm of how you handle the situation. And when you're, let's say, you know, just, just go, c- continuing with that narrative, let's say your child, you know, cut up the couch or, or any, you know, they did something that you weren't happy with. So instead of saying to them, why did you do that? What, what do you say to them at that time? I mean, what, what's like the first thing that, that, you know, that you say to not hurt the relationship that you have with them, but also to convey that, you know, what you just did wasn't, wasn't great or that you do want to try to better understand what exactly was going through their mind. 
No, so that is, I mean, she was so little, right? A two, three-year-old. I can't remember if she was two or three, but she was little. We're not talking about, you know, and she really didn't know. It, I mean, I hadn't taught it to her. I, I it wasn't one of the rules mm-hmm. of the house not to cut up couches. So um, there, <laughs> right, I, right. It was, there I was just conveying scissors are for paper. Like I took, you know what I'm saying? Like there, the message was, I was, I didn't even tell her that she did anything wrong. It was just to instruct her that scissors are for paper and we don't cut up couches. You know, it was more of just like an explanationary right. way of giving over information for instructions purposes. You know, that a lot of times we get, we don't have right, to be right. so, uh, we just have to instru- give over information. That's another thing also, actually, that's really helpful in building relationships is just giving information. You're not trying to judge them. You're not trying, especially also with teenagers, you're not trying to tell them what to do. You're just giving information as you, as though you're a weather person saying, you know what, yeah. today it's going to be 95 degrees outside, you know, da, 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 da. you know, weather information, you know, actually when you go outside and you don't wear a hat, you could get burnt. I'm not judging you. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not, you know, I'm just giving yeah. you information. I'm not trying to t- like be in control of you. Interesting. And what about when you're dealing with, let's say getting a little bit older, when they do understand like six year old or eight year old, or even like 10 years old, when they do something like, let's say punch, punching their sibling or, you know, like something just like, or, or, to, or grabbing something away from someone else, you know, f- from a, from a friend or from a, a sibling. Right. How does, how does, what's so the, if what's there was the something that I actually that knew time? that it was not provoked. I mean, you ha- there's a lot of always factors. We only see a snippet sometimes, but if I actually saw something that was not provoked, sure, the child sure. did something unprovoked and they harmed another person and they knew that that you're not allowed to do that. So then you have to fall through the consequence. There's no such thing as not having a consequence. I mean, the whole Torah says to you, if you listen mm-hmm. to that, you know, you, this will be this. And if you don't, there's a consequence. I think it would be an injustice to the other child who's getting hit if you're not giving over consequence. So you just have to follow through. And a parent can't be, uh, again, right, you can't right, be afraid right. of your child. You know, you just have to have a consequence. And a consequence just means I'm taking control here. You're not in control of yourself. So maybe you're going to go somewhere else or you're not going to be able to play with your sibling because I'm basically, right. I'm taking control over here. It's mm-hmm. a consequence. Right, 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 right. And what's the purpose yeah, of yeah. a consequence is yeah, to- To move on to a-, yeah. a, a No, no, Sorry. <laughs> I was just say the no, no, purpose, please, please, no, the purpose, purpose of the consequence, of the consequence please, please, please. is so that the child will be motivated to not do it again. Like that's also we have to understand. I want to motivate them to do good, mm-hmm. you know, and have my clarity what good is. And I want them to not be motivated and to do repeating this act. Right, right. So it's, 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 it's teaching them for the future and introducing something negative association with that. That way they don't want to come back to that. In the exactly. Future. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to a slightly different segment. I know this is, it's, it's, uh, I know as you, you mentioned to me, this is like unique in a way, or it's, it's different, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, something I've just been thinking about, you know, as we talk about building a relationship with our child. So within our religion, there are, I guess, you know, certain structures at play that often result in, let's say the father spending more time with their sons and mothers sometimes spending more times with their daughters, or, or it could be vice versa. Um, but not necessarily, but usually there are, you know, with shul and Shabbos and, you know, just different things. Sometimes that can result in more closeness or sometimes it can have the opposite effect. So I guess to start with, how does one maximize that, maximize that time, um, spent with that child to be able to relate to, to, to really build that relationship? I think that, um, honestly, like I'm, I'm really thinking about even with my own children, I'm so close with my son and I'm also so close, like I'm so close with my oldest in a mature way. You know, I, I, I'm thinking about all my children, the gender doesn't play an aspect into the closeness with them. Um, and Mm -hmm. there is something to be said that some kids you are probably going to have more of a click with than others because you're human beings. Right. So that would be the same thing, whether I'm spending a lot of time with you or not spending time, there is just an automatic instinctive or chemistry that some people you click with more than others. But that being Mm -hmm. said, I think we should be looking at it that there's nothing wrong. And I like, so value my spouse's relationship also with our children. It's not a competition. We're here as a team. And I think I like, so he has his way of connecting with his child, which might be sitting and learning. And I'm going to have my way of connecting and sitting with my child, which might be going on a walk or might be making cookies. Why should he have to connect to the kid making cookies in the kitchen when his way of connection is by learning? 
And by my daughters, you know, it might be, a, you know, sure. it, it might be he's the Abba who, you know, or I'll give another example. My son, my husband took my son and uh, some of his friends and, and Pesach ben Azmanim. So he took like a car full of Yeshiva Bachrim. They went up to the north and my husband went right with them into the, you know, into the hikes and the river and, out, you know, like he was, he was the, uh, he was the driver and he was awesome. also threw himself in the river with them. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go up with a bunch of 17 year old boys, right. In a river. But does that not mean that? And I I, have, I think it's beautiful. Right. So I'm going to encourage it. It doesn't mean that I'm not close to my son. It just means that that's what Abba does with it. And I have absolutely sure. no problem. And I don't want to be like sure, stereotypical, sure, sure. stereotypical by saying this, but it's true. I have no problem with being close to my son by making him a special meal. He told, he told me on Thursday, right. My husband's going to drive down and visit him. And he said, mommy, can you bring me dinner? And of course, he's not going to ask that on my husband. So uh-huh. that's okay. Like, it's beautiful. Right, 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 right. I guess really more so the question is probably the opposite way. Meaning when you when you have so much time, let's say mother with daughter, father with son. So then how does one build that relationship with the child of the opposite gender? Because I mean, and, and I know you were, you were saying just now you have that relationship, but how does one build it? Because realistically, like you said before, one of the things you said in the beginning was that time is so important. Right. So being that time just naturally within, within our religion is not necessarily always, you know, supportive of that in certain ways. So how does, how does one build that? I think, um, but I think first also the expectations don't have to be the same. I don't have to have the same relationship I'm going to have mm-hmm. with my sons and my daughters. And my husband doesn't have to necessarily have the same relationship. The point is, is it a close, beautiful relationship of what, of what it is? So number one would be expectations. Right. I'm, I'm not right. trying to copy a different relationship. And if it's something that's very natural, that if I'm, yes, it's natural that I would be more close with my daughters because I'm spending more time with them in this setting. I don't, I don't also see a problem. I mean, I just don't even see a problem with it, to be honest with you. I, I, cause I just know I have close relationships with my right. children cause I'm invested. No, in not in a problematic way. Right. It happens. I'm telling you. Right. Even in the no, so I don't mean in a problematic way. I mean, right. more so mean like how, how to build it. I think if you are interested and you take an interest in your child and they're again, going back to the car example that I have no whatsoever curiosity about cars. Mm-hmm. And yet I'm, I'm curious about my kid. So I want to hear about it. It's not this sort of gender thing. It's a, it's an interest thing. You know, it's like, sometimes you, I'm so tired, like on a Shabbos afternoon. And let's say like my seven-year-old would come up to me and be like, mommy, I want to play go fish. I have no interest in go fish. All I want, I want to go fish. I want to go lie down on the couch and I want to go to sleep, <laughs> but I can look at the kid and I can think to myself, right. you know what? I so much want to be with this child, to have a relationship with a child. So I want to play go fish. I think that, it, so then you can translate it into gender also. Like, let's say, you know, so this, so my son, it tells me that, you know, about his iyun and his cute shirim. I have no idea what he's talking about, but I'm excited for him and I can listen to him. I don't have to contribute. I can just contribute by listening. I have to actually add in my chidush, you know, and, and I think that my daughter could talk to my husband about, um, things that I, I happen to be more interested in, like maybe she's an incredible artist and things like this. It's not that because it's a gender thing, but he's not, he doesn't really know so much about it, but he can appreciate it. And he can look at her painting and he can just appreciate mm-hmm. her love of something that he's not interested in. And if it's for five minutes and it's for five right, minutes, it's right. the quality yeah, and right. it's the focusing on the child. It's not that you have to, again, you don't have to be with them for 20 hours in order to have a relationship, but you just, you have to focus at some point. And I, you are an individual, you're not part mm-hmm. of a tribe. You're one kid. I love you. You're mine. And God gave you to me and you chose me also. <laughs> um, and you're the most, right. you're the most important thing. You know, I, I'll tell you something. You know, I jump in three times a day and in every single one of my tefillahs, I, I say, Hashem, please let me have a good relationship with my child. I jump in for it. Like I pray for having a good relationship with my child, that I should be close with them. They should be close to each other. And I also pray mm. that I should be a good shaliyah wow. because I know I'm a shaliyah for my kid, but I just hope I'm a good one. And, mm. and I think these things we have right. to, I'm constantly That's asking awesome. Hashem to help me with this. So it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, and then I'll, another like end note, which Amazing. I also think is really beautiful. I'll never forget this is that um, when my son was one, my in-laws were visiting and I had a very, very close relationship with my mother-in-law, like extremely close. And she was just a remarkable woman and she exuberated love. And she also gave me, she taught me how to, to just give attention to your kid. I don't know how to explain it. She just, she just 
you know, she taught me how not stopping everything because there are times when you can just can't stop everything. But she just had this way about her that I am telling you, each one of her sons knew how much she loved them. Um, and what was interesting to me is I went with wow. her and my little baby at the time. I mean, now he's, uh, we went to Rebetzin Kamenianski. And mind you, my mother-in-law is from Mexico City. She was, I love her, she was from Mexico City. So I, I'll, I'll tell you the story. This is just, we arrived right. there. Right. We don't know anybody. I'm saying it wasn't like we had like some kind of like Ian protection because it nothing. We just arrived there. It was mincha time. Like uh-huh. all people come in mincha time. I have my right. manual baby. I have my mother in law, the Mexican who only speaks Spanish, and myself. And there and the, and the rabbit mm. there. And you know what she did? I t- I somehow I think I told the rabbit that my mother in law is visiting from Mexico City. So she turns to my mother in law. This was now outside the shul. It wasn't in the shul. And she gives her this huge smile. And she's like grabbing her, my mother in law. And she's like pointing to the camera because they don't speak the same language, right? And she's telling and she's telling me, we have to take a picture. It's my friend from Mexico right. City. We have to take a picture. We have to take a picture. My mother in law felt like a million dollars. And it was so wonderful because this is how my mother in law makes people feel. And, she, and Hashem gave it back wow. to her. We take this picture and, and it stays with me in my wow. mind that this Rebetzin, this godless, this woman, that reason why I think Rebetzin was so, so, so. It's because she made this woman visiting from Mexico feel so special. And that's also something I pray for. I say every day, I hope, I'm Zohe, that each one of my children feel that they're like the Ben Yechid or the Bat Yechida. No matter how many kids a person has, that they should know mm-hmm. that I'm so excited to see them. You know, like you walk in the door and, hi, like I'm, I'm actually, I love you. I want you. I'm excited. And you're like in this second, my Ben Yechid or my Bat Yechida. So I think that's... You know, we should be zochet okay to, right, right. to, wow. to do that and to them and to feel that. Amen. 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 Is there any, I, you, 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 I feel like you just gave a final message, but is there any final message that you, that you'd want to give so, besides for that amazing yeah. story and final message? And one more final message is also um, have fun. Like <laughs> we get so worried and so worried about our uh-huh. kids and about being a good parent. I myself can tell you this, like I worry so much and I want the best for them. And am I doing the right? And I, the, the discussions and up like at late with my husband and, and I'll tell you something, I'm telling you this to all the Abbas and all the Imas, we must remember that like Baruch Hu is actually running the show. And if we can give it over a little bit to him, over up to him and mm-hmm. just know that I can do my effort, but the outcome is in Hashem's hands. And I must also enjoy them. Like I, I need to enjoy this. I need to have a little bit of fun here. I need to look at the value of what yeah. it is to be a parent and not feel so heavy. Like we have to remember Hashem loves them more than we do. And I have to remind myself of this all the time that Hashem mm. is the one really who, who's like running the show mm. here and I can just try my best, but the outcome's not in my hands. So it's like, I also have this sort of mission that it. just people wow. should just love being a parent, even though it is very, very, very hard, <laughs> but it's worth it. Right. 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 Yeah. A hundred, a hundred percent. Wow. Thank you so much for giving us so, so much wisdom. It, this was incredible, 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 incredible. You have so much great insights and nuggets to share. And uh, it was such a pleasure speaking with you and thank really you. thank you. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Koto. Thank you so much for tuning in for this second episode on building a relationship with one child. I hope that you were able to gain as much as practical advice as I did. In particular, I loved the idea of reminding ourselves that this is, this is the child we daven for. That's, they're the same neshama, they're just bigger, they're in a bigger body. And to keep that in mind as times get challenging or as we discipline. I love, really love to hear any feedback, any comments, any, anything, any questions you may have on this, visit our website or to email us at genolive.org or call into our new hotline at 833-737-1293 to be featured on a future podcast. While asking any, you can ask any parenting question, really anything at all. It could be on this topic, it could be on anything at all. Leave your name, your number, your question, and don't worry, we'll be making it anonymous. Make sure to follow us at the new OU Parenting Podcast on Instagram at The Parenting The Jews Next Door and on Twitter. Follow me at Yair Michelle for parenting tips, quotes, funny and relevant content. We look forward to continuing this series next week as we get into the intervention episode with this Mrs. Devorah Weiss, who is a certified parent and teen coach and has an expertise in working with teens. Join us again next week as we work together to raise the Jews next door.